Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, I hope everybody's glad they're here because if you wait till about 10 o'clock, it's going you're gonna have a hard time finding a, even getting around this building with uh, with the Reverend Graham coming into town. So. Um, Oh, by the way, if you get your phone, don't turn them off. Since I hear one ringing up here, um, we'll we'll open with prayer. If you'll if you'll join with me, dear Lord and Savior, we're thankful for the blessings of this life. Give us strength, give us understanding, and give us the will to do Thy will. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, whose phone keeps ringing? <laughs> It's a high-tech stuff, huh? Okay. All right, we've got um, we've got a few bills here. First off, we're going to uh, do House Bill 555's committee substitute. Um, Representative Shaw wasn't here. It's not here right now. He's chair of the subcommittee that heard this bill yesterday, and it passed out of subcommittee. Uh, Representative Chandler, if you... Where do you want to do it? You want to come up to the table or to the podium? All right. You'll you'll sit. Okay. House Bill five 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 L C thirty seven twenty one twenty three S. You're on. Thank you, Mr. I hope you're on. Now I am. Okay. Has to be turned on. That's to be turned. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. This. 555 is a data reporting bill. It deals only with getting information regarding juveniles who are getting abortions without parental permission. That's simply what it, what it is. It requires the juvenile, the clerk of the juvenile court to report this information to the administrative office of the courts once a year. Then the administrative office of the courts reports this information once a year to the Department of Public Health. After six months, the information that has been sent from the juvenile court to the administrative office of the courts, that information is destroyed and it is not subject to an open records report. This is just a data getting bill. That's all it is to try to find out to what extent we have juveniles getting abortions without permission. That's the bill, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. Okay, one, one ooh, that's loud. Um, one thing we need to uh, emphasize on this, this is uh, the numbers that the juvenile uh, court sends up these numbers are put in a aggregate there there's no individual num names or anything districts or anything it's all aggregate numbers on the petitions denied approved and whatever uh, so number eight thank you mr. chairman uh, Representative Chandler how is this information um, uh, who sends this information to the to the clerk, juvenile court clerk? How's it gathered? How's it gathered? Mm -hmm. Well, the clerk is the one who's working with the juvenile judge, so that clerk would have access to that information and would be keeping up with it. Okay, and does the clerk's association support this bill? Because they, it's not like they don't have a whole lot else to do already. I, They're overpaid and overworked already. I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure that's true. Uh -huh. They they are they are I would say neutral. They do not object to the to the bill as long as we're keeping the information confidential as to the names of the judges and that is not open to public record. And one last question, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay, so you say that it's not reported by name, just by number. 
So what's the purpose of the bill? I would think if it's by name, you perhaps could find out whether the parents or whoever the guardian was in favor or if it's something they got somebody to just go with them or I mean if it's not a name what's what's the big what's what's the reason for the bill can, can I can I comment sure on that if a young lady gets pregnant mm -hmm. and she does not want to tell her parents she petitions a judge juvenile court judge mm -hmm. uh, that judge has five days in order to have a hearing after the hearing he has five he or she has five day or 48 hours in order to make a determination that is the and and no names are released uh, all this juvenile uh, data is is sealed you know it's not available to anyone it's not uh, subject to open records or any so they'll send that information to the uh, officer uh, administrative officer of the courts and all They'll collate it all together and, and just give an aggregate number for the state of Georgia. That's all this does. I understand that. For what purpose? Just to know the extent what's going on in our state as far as the number of juveniles that are being allowed to have an abortion without parental consent. It's okay. just to have that information. Just, just to have it. it. Just to add it. more data to collect it, for. It is public information from the depart at the Department of Public Health no names no identity at all just a number and was it was this requested by the Department of Public Health no because they got I a whole lot going on but too we, I know that we did meet with the Department of Public Health and they did not object we met with the commissioner thank you mm -hmm. number 20 thank you thank you mr. chairman um, to representative Chandler my question is about the judges. Will the names of the judges no. be revealed in this transaction? No. No, no. no so, names. And when we get this information, what are we going to do with it? It is just public information. Mm -hmm. It is like gathering the number of abortions that occur in our state. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yeah, and this right. is the number of abortions dealing with adolescents who get it without permission <laughs> from parents. Normally, uh, when we bring legislation, it's in response to something. Can you give me some background as to what this is in response to? Well, this came from the Georgia Life Alliance, and it was an effort to find out to what extent we have girls, like I said, who are getting abortions without parental permission. That was it because there, was, there has been no way to no, get, get this information and know what was going on. We know that adolescents, of course, can go to a juvenile judge and be allowed to get an abortion or it can be denied. And it's just to have a number, to have some idea. It's just like gathering information, how many abortions do we have occurring in the state? Well, uh, um my last thing is, if, if we were gathering this information to make a difference or to, or to do something about whatever the stats were, I, I could understand that, but just to have the information uh, that may or may not be secured and, and what's going to happen if we have a data breach and the judges' names are released or the individual's juveniles' names are released, because you know that happens in this state. Well, I, I think there are precautions that are set up to prevent that from happening of course as we know anything can happen with data mm -hmm. but if the names of the girls never leave the juvenile court see they're not leaving there that information is going just the from the from the clerk of the juvenile judge is going to the administrative office of the courts mm -hmm. That's where it's sealed, right there. Well, I have a lot of respect for our juvenile judges, and I would hate for us to have a data breach and juvenile judges have some I would too. Uh, repercussions based on the decisions that they make uh, in regard to the information that is before them. So that, that's my concern. It is my understanding that this has been discussed with a number of the juvenile judges in the, in the state, and they do not object to it. Twenty-six, Representative Chandler. Thank you yes. for bringing this forward. I, I really do appreciate it. 
Um, I wanted to ask a question. As of right now, the state does not have any transparency in regard to uh, young girls having these uh, procedures, abortions done, without their parents' permission. Is that correct? That is my understanding. And without this bill, we would not have any kind of transparency. And again, we're not going to know patients or doctors or judges. We're just going to know statistics, correct? That is correct. We want to know how big of an issue this might be. Exactly. Because <clears throat> going back to what Representative Hugley said, if we, if we know the extent of this, then we might know a way to, to deal with it if that was the wish of the state. Is this, uh, thank you for that, and so we're only collecting statistical information. I would argue that there would be a risk of a data breach whether we had this bill or not, but that's just, that's just my interpretation of, of the process. What transparency is there in other states in regards to statistics only? Uh, because I, li I like the fact that this is just statistics because I don't want any repercussions uh, despite the, that I disagree with this practice. It is legal. It needs to be upheld as legal by the court system and our government. So I don't want doctors being persecuted or threatened or victim of hate crimes or so forth. So this is just statistical information. To what extent is this kind of information available in other states? maybe our border states and so forth. I do not know that, Representative Carson. Okay. Well, I thank you for this bill and um, appreciate you bringing it forward. Number 11. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, you are now. There we go. Um, see if I can help the process a little bit. I practiced in juvenile court an awful lot. That data is already there. The names are already there. The judges already maintain that information and it's held in a secure manner. So, uh, and we, I just co-sponsored a bipartisan bill with the minority leader uh, where we were going to get data on children of military families. And the reason we did it is because that's one of the requirements of the BRAC Commission when the BRAC Commission comes in. We don't know what we're gonna do with that data. We know we're collecting it to see what's happening with these children and I can see, and I don't, I don't want the anything but numbers released, but I can see us uh, reallocating our resources and that sort of thing toward uh, educating children and sex education and that sort of thing. So uh, I wanted to add a little bit to the process there. They already have the information. There's not a data breach now. So thank you for bringing the bill. Number eight, do you have another question? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I'm just really trying to get a, a, a grip on what the outcome that you're expecting for this legislation. So um, one question that I didn't ask is what role do doctors, what obligation will this add to doctors in this process? Nothing. It will add none. None. So they're not required to submit it. It has nothing to do with doctors. Okay. But so the bill just basically adds additional responsibility to DCH, additional responsibility to the juvenile court judge, clerk, I mean ju clerks, uh, and then there was potentials for breaches and, you know, folks that don't support abortion, anybody that has anything to do with it, they are targets. So that's basically what this bill is doing, will we'll do, to collect data that, without names, I, I just for collecting. That's right. I don't all see those. that it's making anybody a target. That is not the purpose at all. Number one. Uh, Representative Chandler, uh, thank you for bringing this bill. And uh, a, a man that usually wants smaller government and don't want a lot of government, uh, get a little personal. Uh, I might not have my son. I don't think this would have happened, but I might not have my son if my wife had had this choice, which I don't think she would have chosen it, but that might not have been any of my business. Maybe it was. But a father of, of, of fifth. A, fa a grandfather of five granddaughters, I would like to know that maybe this process would uh, put forth some information that we could educate more and, and, and have less teen pregnancies. And to me, this is not about uh, trying to harm anyone, but trying to gather data that would might reduce our teen pregnancies in this state. And I appreciate you for bringing the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we know what's going on, then we can educate. 
Okay, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I guess it's time for. Okay, we have a move to uh, approve and do pass. Second, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. No. Um, did carry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Blackman, another one? <laughs> you you want to come down front, Mr. Blackman? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to turn him into a rock. Yeah, if you want to. Yeah, we're going to turn Mr. Blackman into a rock star for it's all over. And, and um, Representative Meadows is going to join him on this particular little project. Uh, Chairman Meadows, I just heard the term extortion. Is, is Would you mind telling me which one of them said <laughs> 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 All right, Mr. Blackman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 838. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I'm honored to have, well, I'm not sitting beside me once. Uh, <laughs> Chairman Meadows, um, House Bill 838, um, I believe you have it before you. Um, in short, it is um, basically certain health insurance plans um, requires that health insurance companies uh, compensate with a 5% commission on small groups, 50 or less employees. The um, few little little points I think worth noting, um, health insurance companies have, you know, made the decision here recently and we're seeing that they are, are taking these commissions away from small independent insurance agents. And the questions that we're trying to answer with this bill are, you know, should agents be fully compensated for their services? and should small groups be allowed to have an advocate um, on their behalf. Um, so I think, you know, by, by passing this bill, we are being a friend to, to small business on a couple of fronts. So um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I'd, I'd ask for, for the committee's favorable consideration. Okay. I'm going to uh, uh, ask Mr. Meadows if he would like to comment on this bill because it's, it's, it's important. You want to slide the microphone over? Reason for the bill, I've been doing this for 38 years. And over that period of time, it, uh, the commissions for agents has decreased almost by 50%. The agent has no say in that. It is purely led by the insurance companies. What's happening across this United States, and we've had four or five states, I don't know which one, that have just recently approved insurance premium taxes like the state of Georgia has. Uh, the insurance companies in those states did not, they, they accepted it and they turned right around and they took it directly off the commissions of the agent. You look around at your towns, how, ma how many of you have a small insurance agency in your community. I would be willing to bet you that you have three or four. They have anywhere from four to five employees. You've got some that have larger. Uh, that's the heart of not only the insurance business, but small business is the heart of, of this United States. And it was an attempt. Uh, the attempt really was to get my insurance companies to the table. Uh, They've, I won't say they've dragged their feet because they hadn't showed up. Uh, I had one, and uh, out of and we announced this in August to get some conversations started, and uh, they chose not to do so. If they're not going to be a part of this, uh, I'm asking that you make them come to the table. Again, it's just a small business thing. You, you, I look up here at 
on this panel and I see several of you that are in the small business insurance side of it in your communities and again all this does is is ensures that the agent uh, gets compensated for the work he does why is it 50 and below you get 51 it becomes large groups large groups the majority of them have a staff agents probably work less on large groups other than getting the business than they do on small business because you get out here to a mom and pop organization that's all of a sudden grown they've got 15 employees and they barely know how to do payroll much less benefits and the phone call does not come to the insurance company the phone call comes to the agent and he spends probably 75 percent of his time working with that small business a small business helping a small business and that's all it's about okay we have I think four questions we'll start with number 15 thank you mr. chairman um, if it's okay I just a couple of quick questions I'm not an insurance agent so just trying to understand how uh, how all this works um, when if you're an independent agent and you decide I want to sell Pre policies from you know, such and such a company are uh, are commissions known up front, or how is how were how was it a commission uh, agreed to and arrived to normally in those sorts of situations? I'm not an insurance agent myself either, to be honest with you. Sure, I understand. Most agents know approximately what because they're set. The insurance companies that happen to be competitive or have networks in your particular part of the state, that's the companies that you deal with. If you've got a company that does not have a network or does, does not have doctors, you're not going to offer it anyways, even if they've got the best rates by far. You're going to offer, in most agents, they shop the business. You try to get the, try to get the business owner the best possible deal. So he's going to look at or she's going to look at four or five different companies if they have that many in the state. All of those companies pay some sort of commission except right. for about two who don't pay any. Right. And I don't know how they sell any business. but they. And the, the problem is not that you, you're getting the commission. It's a problem that if you renew the business and the insurance aid company comes back, which they have, on a regular basis and said well our new commission scale starting with your right. renewal is this and you have no say in it and that might be the best product for your consumer right. and so it, it you the agent knows what most of the companies that are competitive in his or her section great one, one other quick question uh, chairman Meadows is five percent sort of the the norm or uh, it, I understand there's downward pressure I, now, and that's one of the reasons you're bringing the bill, but 5% would be considered normal? Uh, it, that's about what normal is now. Okay. Uh, it started, I can tell you, within the last seven, eight years, it's gone from 10 to 5. Right. It's 10, it's 8, it's 7, it's 5. And y'all, just to let you know, this doesn't bother me any. I'm 71. If, if all the insurance <laughs> companies quit selling this, I can go home but there's a lot of agents out here that uh, contribute greatly to this state who can't go home yeah and if they haven't got a way of basically having some minimum amount that they know they're going to get they may as well not get in the business great thank you thank you mr chairman thank you and number 20. Uh, thank you mr chairman to the authors of, of the bill um i i spoke with um some agents in Columbus and they share your concerns and uh, what they're saying is that they are servicing uh, their clients to the best of their ability and they're not getting they're not getting paid uh, for that and they're not getting paid um, the entire amount and this is not just for mm -hmm. these uh, large groups but on, on individual policies uh, if there is a discount or if the person is on the ACA and there's a discount, they're not, they're not getting, they're only getting what 
what the person pays. They get a percentage of what the person pays and not the full amount. So this is a problem uh, that, that my agents in Columbus are seeing as well. On the individual health side of the business, uh, the commissions are all over the place. Uh, none of them are high, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. But some are paid on a per case basis. It doesn't matter what your premium is. Others are paid on. That right now, there is one company making money in that business, and I don't know how long they'll do it. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't got a lot of there is pay. It's not. Is it fair? No, it is not. Uh, and they, they've agreed to do some things on the. You have open enrollment. Uh, y'all, y'all don't want an insurance lesson, but in 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 the new ACA plan, you have open enrollment. It runs from November to January. November the first to January the thirtieth. That is basically the only time that you can sell an individual a health plan. Mm -hmm. If you sell it outside that time, it comes under what they call a special enrollment period. The insurance companies are willing to continue paying something, whether it's on the discounted premium, or, or a lot of people don't get the discount, mm -hmm. or on the entire premium. They, they have agreed to continue paying something. That period of time where you have that sp special enrollment time, Mm -hmm. You and everybody else here ought to know who you're going to get. The only reason you get that is for a qualifying event. Almost I any excuse is considered as a qualifying event now. But what does the insurance get, the insurance company? They get the people that are sick. They get the people that are old and then like the premium that they saw under the other one. And who is going to have the claims on those things? Y'all, my, my youngsters don't have claims. When you get about 60, you start having claims. They probably do 80% <laughs> of the claims from 60 on, and at around 65, it turns into 90. What we've agreed to is that they don't pay a commission on that particular product. If that product renews, you get a commission. The question that I that I was asked to ask is the, or the concern that was expressed is that the number of companies in the marketplace, particularly in the Columbus area, has is shrinking, and they really are down to a couple of companies that they really can uh, offer competitive products. Do you think this bill would in any way affect that? Not really, because most companies are kind of, you know, the state's cut up in divisions, mm -hmm. and, and certain companies are, and it's the companies that have networks there. Because, you know, it'd be wonderful if I got a Aetna program up there in Gordon County, but I got no doctors and no hospitals that right. take Aetna. But it's just the companies that have that. And they're shrinking and shrinking, because I think I preface this, but there is one making money. Okay. Just as, I mean, I, I, not to really to augment from the consumer side of it. I mean, I, I'm a small business person myself. We have 42 employees at my office, and we uh, we have some uh, an agent that helps us with our health insurance. And I, I, f I fear what would happen if we did not have that agent advocating on our behalf for our employees when certain things come down the line, whether a claim's denied or, or what might happen. And I think that uh, it's important to us, uh, not only do we not have the resources internally to do that, but if we lost that advocate, what would, what would, you know, what would we rely on from that point forward? Okay. Number three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got um, a couple of questions, and the, the 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 first one is intended to: What was the sales tax that was passed on from the insurance companies, 
and they put it upon the agents. I mean, w what percentage was that? On those states that have just done this? Yes, sir. Uh, it, m most of it runs one and a half percent, I think. It can get up. What do we have? I don't know what we have in Georgia anymore. Hold on. Where's Lindsay? Nope. It's a little less than five, I think. Four and three quarters. And, and those that did it, of that four and three quarters, insurance, it's called insurance premium rollback tax. The state gets part of it and cities and counties get the rest of it. In the early 90s, they changed the rules at the state cities and counties got it they they had one thing they could do with it and that is roll back your property taxes and that's what everybody does with it you're paying it they're giving some of it back and it's charged on every insurance policy mm -hmm. that's written whether it be property and casualty whether it be life and health whether it be disability you there is insurance premium tax charged on that policy the companies then report back the, the, the amount of premium that they've done, and then that will come into their tax by the state for that, and then the state doubles it back out to the cities and counties. Thank you. The, the, the second question is, would you be supportive of a friendly amendment of changing the 5 to 7 percent? Watch this. No. <laughs> I, I I think it's a where we are again. That's about what we're making. Again, I I hate it that they've done it, but if I get too carried away with this, guess who's going to pay me that extra two percent? Well, I don't know, sir. My customers. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Because the insurance companies aren't just going to eat that out of profits, and a lot of my insurance companies ain't making big profits in the health insurance business now. And it would go. They they had no other choice but to refile rates, and those rates will include that two percent, and that two percent will come out of the premium payer's pocket. Number one, quick quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I got some letters and emails from people, and uh, during that closed enrollment, there some people are actually not getting paid anything for those policies they're selling. They only offer it to be able to be a full service uh, agency. Let, let me, you've got to choose to be in that business. I choose not to be in that business. I, I was in it for one, one re real big sign up. Y'all got time to listen to this story? <laughs> had a, I had a client, 103 employees, fully insured, his rates went to $1,000 an employee. His agent, me, went to him and said, you can't afford this anymore. Your employees can't pay their portion of, uh, of the bill. You need to put all of them on the exchange. At that time, I had a young lady that could do exchange business, sent her up there. She stayed a week. You interview everyone, y'all. It takes 45 minutes to an hour to do one sit down with these people. And we interviewed all 103. I want y'all to ask me how many took the insurance. How many took the insurance, sir? Three. What does that mean? It means that I have 100 people out there on the streets that are not insured from that one company. They can't afford forget, and they 90% of them qualified for help and they still couldn't afford it because if you check what the only plan we offer out there to our people it's called the bronze plan your deductible six thousand dollars if I can't pay the premium how in the H am I going to pay a six thousand dollar deductible you can't and so now we're going to penalize them the penalty went up this year oh I don't have the money to pay it uh, there's something that happens in this country when it comes to tax time. Most everybody gets a refund whether they've paid any taxes or not. And what's going to happen, it's going to come out of that money. Before they receive their check, it will, their penalty will be deducted. 
Okay, number 18. I want to thank both of you all for bringing this bill. Um, before I was in the legislature, I bought insurance from a friend there in Gainesville rather than the Georgia Dental Association. And when I retire or get retired out of this body, I hope he and his son are still in business. And Carl Rogers. My good friend Carl Rogers. I don't want to have to feed him. I got seven kids, and Carl eats more than they do, I think. Okay, I, that looks like that's all the uh, question. I think it's time for a motion. We got a second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Blackman, you Thank need you. to go see the rules chairman and get your bills on this calendar. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, the next three bills are from uh, Representative Taylor. All of these are for the insurance commissioner's office, and they're all the purpose of these is for accreditation purposes. And I'm going to ask uh, Lindsey Scott from the insurance commissioner. Where is Ralph? He said he was going to be here this morning. I thought he was too. I'm a little surprised. I thought he was going to be here we, we just might need to delay these for another week or two. Please don't do no, that. No, okay. I wouldn't do that to you. Okay. You've worked too hard on these faults too long. Okay, Representative Taylor. No, I guess do 882 first and do them in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to be here this morning, and thank you, members of the committee, for hearing this bill. these bills. These are all... Um, what we would call modernization for our insurance department. Be sure you give us the LLC number. Yes, we'll start with 882 LC 372110S. Okay. Um, this is a very simple bill. Actually, this is one that um, has to do with uh, requirements for security for investment for capital funds. It modernizes Georgia's regulations of security deposits by okay. not uh, requiring small deposits okay, on all foreign carriers. What we have is a problem with reciprocal agreements with other states. Our uh, in-house carriers, our domestic carriers are being penalized because we are doing it differently and charging more than what other states are doing. And it's become a, a problem for our carriers. Um, it eliminates conflicting language in our current law. It benefits the Georgia Department of Insurance Efficiencies by eliminating the need to administer some 1,500 uh, deposits. It benefits Georgia's domestic companies that have to behold the same deposits when they go into these other states. Uh, it does not affect Georgia or any other state's requirements of domestic insurers to hold a security deposit for the benefit of these policyholders. And this is what it's really all about. So I would ask, I'll answer any questions that you have. I've, I've got one. W what happens if we lose our accreditation? Uh, I'll let Lindsay yeah. handle that one. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. and. Um, Members of the committee. Y'all listen, this is important. <laughs> if we lose our accreditation, our insurance companies here in the state of Georgia would then have to go through a very tenuous and tedious process in other states in which, in which they would wish to operate, um, including filings of forms and um, a lot of other onerous provisions that those states might require. By maintaining our accreditation, those companies, in fact, only have to do those things here in Georgia, and that's accepted in the other states in which they conduct business. And, and if we lose our accreditation, it's going to cost the state a boatload of money. Yes, sir, and it would cost us quite a bit of money. Okay. That was House Bill 882. I don't see any questions. I guess it's time to have due passed. I hear a second. I'll, I'll Okay, yeah. Is this one by substitute, Mr. Yes, it's by oh, substitute. By substitute, okay. All right, so we got 882 by substitute. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. All right. New pass. Okay, 883. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, this has to do with statutory deposits. Uh, these deposits are certain sums of money that are held in account for the protection of the Georgia policyholders. In this case, the commissioner needs to have this money to pay claims if somebody should go insolvent. Um, opening up an ancillary receivership would also take a lot of time, waste the superior court's time. All of these are technicalities that, again, if we don't have that NAIC accreditation, we will have so many problems, just like Lindsay said, with our other, um, I guess, our other carriers. Um, 
included in this, it's, it's further, I, I hate to say this, but we're using antiquated procedures. Um, I'm told almost no states do it this way anymore. So we need to be in the 21st century. So I would ask for your favorable consideration of this bill. Okay, we have a substitute uh, House Bill 883-LC-372115-S. Uh, I guess it's time for a motion. Uh, second. Okay, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed like sign. All right, we're on a roll. Okay, House Bill 884. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This needs to have uh, language added to OCGA 33-56-3. Um, maintain compliance with NAIC again to make that accreditation of part of a, a schedule. This accreditation program was established to develop and maintain standards to promote effective insurance company financial solvency regulations. NAIC accreditation allows non-domestic states to rely on accredited domestic regulators to fulfill a baseline level of effective financial regulatory oversight. This creates a substantial efficiency for insurance regulators who are then able to coordinate and rely on each other's work. All 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, are currently accredited. The um, three variations of the trend test related to this specific NAIC instructions for those types of annual statements required to be filed. Um, these are all, again, very technical, but it's things we need to do. I, I really would hope that you will pass this bill and let us make sure we maintain our accreditation. We've got one question. Number, t oh, we got two now. Number 26, Mr. Carson. Thank you, Representative Taylor, um, and, and Lindsay for bringing this forward. Lindsay, I presume RBC is risk-based capital? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Can you uh, define for me total adjusted capital? Uh, I cannot. <laughs> is there a mention of that? In the I think what we're basically talking about, it's an online 11. I think we're, what we're basically talking about is a company that has higher than just one times risk-based capital, but not substantially capitalized. They would, they would fall into some sort of uh, out-of-state filing or event right. So it, it, language in the statute. Is that correct? Uh, representative, so it does speak to their solvency, and this RBC trend test statute would trigger what we would, or would cause us to request this report from the company. And is, and is this NAIC uh, this is, language? This is an NAIC, uh, based on an NAIC model. It's an accreditation standard. And this is simply adding the definition of health organizations to the existing statute. Health organizations previously were not included in the statute. Um, and for what reason, I candidly do not know. Um, and the definition of health organizations that's included here is rather broad because there are states, other states that, of course, will have this added to their statute as well that define health organizations more broadly than we here do in Georgia. In the 3.0 on line 13, is that NAIC or is that Georgia Department of Commission? That's NAIC. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, number 10. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm just a follow-up to uh, Representative Carson's question. The, the, the risk-based capital on line 12, risk-based capital but less than the product of its authorized control uh, level risk-based capital in 3.0. So that's some, we're multiplying that. Multiplying the authorized. Well, with the product. Yeah, it's, it's, so this language is directly out of, uh, it's just um, unclear in the, this is, if this is math, it's yes, just, sir. it's just, <clears throat> so is this, I take another look at it. Are you sure we're copying this language? Yes, sir, we are. And it's, it's, so, what the company would be required to maintain in order to, for us to feel comfortable that they're solvent and able to pay their claims. As I understand it, this is that number times 3%. But it doesn't say 3%, it just says 3.0. That's why it was, this. it's not a percent. Uh, or three sorry, times. three times, yes. So sir. that's a product. We're multiplying the risk-based capital control, authorized control level risk-based capital times three. Correct, because it is a product. It's just, it's just sort of a little bit unclear to me. Uh, but understand. if that's the model language that all the other states are using, fine. It's just yes, slightly sir. confusing. And Representative Williamson, I can have Mark O.C., who is the director of our insurance and financial oversight division, reach out to you, and um, he knows a lot that, that more about the technical aspects of this. <laughs> I 
candidly don't know as much about the technical aspects as he does, but I do know that this is, again, <coughs> model language and it is an accreditation standard for us at the department. Okay, that looks like all the questions. I guess we got a recommend due pass. I have a second. Okay, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. Um, we've got two meetings left before crossover next week. Uh, the only thing that's on the agenda currently is House Bill 965. Mr. Chokas, 965 next week. All right. Uh, meetings adjourned. We'll see y'all in in rules or somewhere.